Laura, who are we talking to today? Well, Nikki, as we mentioned in the first of our accountability group series of episodes, most of our interviews have been with people who are much further along in their creative businesses. But one of our basic premises of starting this podcast was to have you come along with us on the journey of just getting things started. Now, the women in our accountability group all began with goals. They didn't know where to begin, and they've achieved big things in just the last couple of years by putting one foot in front of the other. And just fucking getting started. (laughs) Yes, Nikki. And just getting the heck started. (laughs) (laughs) Now, you may have listened to Isabel Wood tell her story on getting started selling digital assets. And if you haven't yet, go back and check out episode 95. We think you'll find it very relatable. So today we're excited to introduce you to another member of our accountability group, Jennifer Long, who started with the dream of becoming a fabric designer for her favorite company, Riley Blake Designs, and she did just that. Hi, this is Laura Lee Griffin. And this is Nikki May with the Stardust Society, inspiring you to stop getting in your own way and start building an art biz and life that you love. We are artists who believe strongly in the power of community, accountability, following your intuition, taking small actionable steps and breaking down the barriers of fear and procrastination that keep you stuck. Follow along with us on our creative business journey as we encourage you on yours. Jennifer Long is a Riley Blake Designs fabric designer, quilt and doll pattern writer, machine embroidery digitizer, and online educator. She is the creator of the Be So Inspired Makers Club and is also a wife, a mom to four, and lives on a hobby farm in the prairies in Manitoba, Canada. Jennifer, welcome to the Stardust Society. We're so excited to chat with you today. Hi, Laura. Hi, Nikki. I am so thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me on the show today. So, Jen, we like to start everybody off by having them share their Stardust story. And we know that you began in a very different career from what you're doing now. You were a professional ballet dancer. That is right. Um, And maybe... I don't know. It's it's interesting to sort of like see the whole story and how it shapes who you are. And you can't always see it from the beginning. But um, yeah, I I wanted to be a ballet dancer. And I think the skills that I learned there um, about like focus and hard work and determination, which we'll talk about, I am sure more in this podcast, have sort of led me um, through the right paths that I needed to do what I'm doing now. Wait, you know how to focus? Can you teach me? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Well, no, I can't say that I do it all the time, but hyper focus definitely is is a is a skill that I do have. Yeah, so tell us how you got started with that and about the transition that ended up with where you are now. For sure. So, um, yeah, I, I trained to be a ballet dancer and I was, I got into a professional ballet school. So we trained half day dance and half day a school and I was very focused on it. But, um, at a very young age, I was exposed to sewing, um, in a number of different ways, but my grandmother owned a sewing and knitting store. So she would make doll clothes um, for us and we go there for the weekend and visit her. And um, so I learned to sew from my grandma um, and I just enjoyed like knitting leg warmers and different things for dance. But it really wasn't until I started dancing more professionally and got to walk onto the third floor, um, which was the costume wardrobe. It was an entire huge room with windows all along one side. I remember it so clearly. And mannequins that had tutus and all of the elaborate costumes that you know from theater and from ballet and they had yeah 20 to 30 seamstresses in there and I thought this is such a magical place it was so (laughs) it just really excited me because I thought well if I couldn't have a long career dancing or if I ever got injured I needed to have a backup plan and I thought sewing was definitely going to be that for me because um, all that hard work dancing and then I would just walk into that room and just see what they would do with those bolts of fabric and they would just transform, you know, you as a dancer and then transform the whole stage. And I just got so lit up by it. So, Mm -hmm. so I really just started 
with that focus, learning to sew, I took, um, this wasn't on the online course time yet. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I took, um, courses and home at courses on sewing still. And I learned to sew with stretchy fabrics and just different things. And I started sewing for myself for costumes. And I guess I got good enough that other people started asking me to sew costumes for them. So I really just started doing that. And I actually ran my own dance studio for seven years. Oh, wow. And so many of the costumes, so 300 costumes a year. Uh, oh, wow. For our like dancers in the school. But I was married and had our, was pregnant with our first child and had all the nesting instincts <laughs> and wanted to sew, you know, bibs and baby claws and burpee towels, which I never really got into. And um, living where we live in prairie, rural Canada on a farm. Now, this is where my husband is from. Um, mm -hmm. It's a big quilting community here. And I got super excited that you could buy all of these beautiful fabrics with different art on them mm -hmm. and cut them all up and cut the art up in different ways and then make art in a quilt. And it was just, just like eye-opening to me. And I just never looked back. I made my first quilt for my son and then they have so many quilts now. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I bet they do. So how long ago was this? Um, so my son is 17 now. So that mm -hmm. would be like 17 years ago. And right away then I decided I wanted to sell my dance studio and when I had my first child um, because I wanted to stay home. So I sold my dance studio and stayed home with them, but I'm very type A, busy, busy person and love, 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 love being at home with my kids. And I should say also that in this time, I guess um, I've never really used it, I say, but I guess I do. Um, I did get it in my early childhood education degree, <laughs> just mm -hmm. in case I was, I ever needed it. And I never used it for what it was intended for, but it definitely has shaped who I am. And I will talk about niches and stuff in a minute. Did you actually think that you might use it or was it always just kind of a fallback plan? Um, it was always a fallback plan if, I mean, I, I love children. I like, I was passionate about children. Well, you made four of them. <laughs> we do have four kids. And, um, and I just thought, you know, if I ever wasn't able to teach in my dance studio, then I, that I would, um, you know, run a daycare or work at a nursery school or something like that. Yeah. So, but when my, I, when I sold my dance studio to stay home with my kids, I, I wanted to be busy and, um, I was very, very, very creative and I was used to sewing a lot of costumes. And so I wanted my kids to have something special and handmade. And that's where the dolls came in because with my aesthetics from dance and the human body and, um, the journey that I was on, as a dancer and eating disorders and all of that, I did not want that for my, my any of my four kids. And I didn't want to buy hard plastic toys for them that had unrealistic body images in them. So I... Hallelujah. Yeah. I decided to create um, and design my own. I couldn't find anything at the time. This is, like I said, 17 years ago. I couldn't find anything at the time that was soft for young kids that they could take clothes on and off of. And um, the soft doll industry has definitely grown, but these are not new. Like a rag doll is something that, you know, our grandmothers made. Well, your grandmothers. <laughs> <laughs> just started, just started on the new um, and made it new. And I quickly decided that I wanted to up level it. So I started taking machine embroidery digitizing so I could, mm -hmm. so I could digitize and um, produce dolls at a faster rate with like more skill, I could draw all the doll features and then digitize them. And I was able to get a uh, amazing work contract with a company called Piccolina. Mm -hmm. And I designed dolls for them overseas, actually for overseas production. So it was just opening up my eyes to a whole world that I could work in. Can you tell us a little bit about how that collaboration with Piccolina came about? I guess by social media would be the only way that I think I could say it. And I don't even have a, a huge following. So I don't think listeners that you need this big following to be successful. In fact, I know you don't need a big following mm -hmm. to be successful. <laughs> it just needs to be the right following. It just mm -hmm. needs to be the right people. Exactly, Nikki. We've talked about this before mm -hmm. that um, that we really just need to be. And, and Instagram isn't what it was 
eight, nine years ago, right? Then, you know, when it first started, it really isn't what it, it was then. It was easier to be noticed on there. There wasn't quite as much, I don't know, noise and the algorithms weren't what they are now. So right. it, I think it was easier then, but um, I actually saw Piccolina and started following them because I loved the style and what they were standing for. So they are for empowering young females to, um, to be trailblazers basically. Mm -hmm. And I just, I love what the company stood for. And I started following them. And I guess because I started following them really early in their journey, um, they took notice of me and they actually reached out to me, um, because of all of the dolls I was posting and, and the work that I was doing already. That's amazing. Yeah. At that point, I mean, I was doing work for some independent like children's book artists and things like that too. So I was doing some like doll designing for smaller collaborations like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was my first really big one. And at the same time, parallel to this, I wanted to stay home with my kids. So I was writing quilt patterns for my own label, but I also was able to ghost write quilt patterns, starting with a number of small fabric companies. And then kind of as you get experience and learn the industry and all the things building up to working with a lot of bigger fabric companies all behind the scenes. And it was just perfect when I was raising my young children. And I just love this industry so much. I have a question because you mentioned the Piccolina. And I think that actually happened in the last few years since we've met you. Is that is that right? That's right. So you remember when we were <laughs> that I would be we were producing the dolls at that point then. So we actually brought some um over to North America and we were, you are right. We were producing some of those dolls at that point, but just so listeners can have an idea that when you see anything like any art fabric product doll, there are years before that it's happening. So there were so many prototypes that were going back and forth. So many, so mm -hmm. th there were multiple years before it got to the point where anybody can see any kind of success. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So didn't you have like, like what types of dolls did you do? Didn't you have a Frida doll? I want a Frida doll. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I had a Frida doll we designed. Um, we designed a Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We did a Mae Jemison doll, um, Amelia Earhart, Rosa Parks. Um, there was just a number of wonderful, strong female leaders um, that we uh, portrayed in a soft rag doll form. And it was just a really exciting, exciting time. We'll show some photos of those in the show notes because they're just both really, really cool and adorable. Kind of like you, Jen. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So while that was all happening, I had this dream that I never thought possible until I met you guys. <laughs> so um, I kind of had it in my heart that I really wanted to design fabric. I mean, I was writing quilt patterns for lots of different designers of all kinds of levels, big designers, big fabric designers, small fabric designers, big companies, small companies. So I was seeing a lot of different fabrics and thinking, I have so many ideas that I would like to share too. And so I took immersion and that's how we met. Um, so mm -hmm. I could, but I already knew um, a lot of the skills that I think I needed to know, but just it really helped me kind of get confidence and put put my workflow together, I think. And I think the biggest thing is confidence, really. And just being in this accountability group really made me have a voice to say that there is a possibility that you could do this, that you, mm -hmm. um, you know, that it's not just for somebody far away in the distance that, you know, it happens to real people like all of us. Yeah. I mean, if nothing else, we are each other's cheerleaders, you know, we're just yeah. encouraging, except when it's time for Nikki boot camp, <laughs> <laughs> which we do need often. I need a Nikki boot camp often. <laughs> Absolutely. That's our tough love that Nikki brings to the table. That's right. <laughs> I think I think one thing for me that I would just love to talk about or a couple of things I would love to talk about on this podcast. But one thing for me was I think we mentioned it at the beginning was hyper focus. And um, I took this step, I guess it was next step in my business investment with one goal in mind. And it was a very, very specific goal that I wanted to be a fabric designer, but it was more specific than that. And I think you mm -hmm. kind of mentioned that, Nikki, is that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to design, and I spoke it, I think, on our first meeting that I wanted to design for Riley Blake Designs. 
And that is the only company I applied for. I did not apply um, for any other company. And I think it's very worth noting that I applied to them. I submitted an app, like submitted my portfolio mm-hmm. and they turned me down the first year. They turned me down and that didn't stop me. I didn't go to another fabric company and I had connections in other fabric companies, mm-hmm. but I really wanted this company. And, um, well, I have a bunch of questions about oh, relate related to that. Yeah, go ahead. So first, what is it about Riley Blake that was like, this is the company I want to design fabric for? All the things I just love. <laughs> <laughs> just a few, just a few okay. examples would be fine. Um, I mean, a number of things. This, the style, their style of design is um, really in line with my style. So I feel like that number one. Mm-hmm. Number two is I know a lot of different people in the industry and a lot of the designers at Riley Blake are my people. Um, like I am aligned with just, you know, the, their thinking, just like their um, passion, just their work ethic, just every, everything. I just that. And then to go one step further, the company as a whole is just, it's a family. It really is. And they say that all the time. They say they call it the RBD mm-hmm. family because it really truly is not a work environment. It is just a family. And I just wanted, I just knew I wanted to be in there. It was just so strong in my heart. I don't, I don't know how else to say it. (laughs) That answers my question. That's great. So, um, okay. So you submitted to them and they turned you down. So then what did you do next? So, well, like any normal, um, person that invests a lot of time into, a portfolio, like we know that it takes a lot of who we are and a lot of your own self goes into your, your portfolio right. and to get rejected in any way. Um, it's like hurtful, but mm-hmm. it also can make you stronger. And so this is where I think I drew on my, um, experience in the dance world, because in the dance world, there's so much rejection and there's such fierce competition. And if, if you let a no stop you, then you won't go anywhere. So I was sad, obviously, as, as you know, as you would be, but, of course. but, um, I quickly turned that into now, let me look at this critically. What can I do and how can I improve? And now looking back, so I took the whole next year and, and just assessed myself. I think I asked you guys what, you know, I, mm-hmm. I mean, I did lots of assessment and how I could improve things. And I just kept my focus and it was like, I just kept, kept, kept my focus. I didn't decide to like go for a different company or anything else. I just want, I really wanted this. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. And I have a question. Did they give you some feedback when you were turned down at that stage that you could then use to perhaps integrate into the next time you approach them? I don't remember getting it. Of course, I think it was definitely given with love because that's just who the company was. And I didn't feel, um, I didn't feel like hurt as a human being or anything like that. It was just, you know, not now, but, um, I don't remember getting any, any big feedback. Yeah. I was just curious to know, like, what do you need, you know, how do you sit there and go, okay, what do I need to change to make it more appealing or to reach my goal? Well. This is my next thing I really wanted to speak on, um, and it is niching. So I want to say that because I was already pretty clear on my niche that I wanted to design for children, but I still wasn't as niche as I am now, and I think as I will be, because um, it's really frightening. <laughs> To niche, <laughs> it's really scary to niche because I like I love a um, like a farmhouse quilt style as much as anybody else does. You know, like I love all the things, and I just love all the mediums, and I love all the different styles and colors. And so to be, it's scary to niche yourself. But I critically looked at the company of my dreams mm-hmm. and decided that there was a space for me in the niche that I wanted to be in. And I just really tried to focus myself in on there um, and come back in a really strong, in a really strong way and make sure that the next time I submitted was going to be very strong. And you did. 
And I did. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about how you niched. How did you niche down? Um, I think you guys you probably even remember me talking about it um, and struggling with it back and forth um, because I, I I was creating quilt patterns that were um, like for home decor too. And I had even a club that was, um, you know, having a clientele even. I already had customer base that wasn't children focus, you know, it was like home decor focus. And mm -hmm. from having home decor quilts and and then just being able to really turn the business side of me just to focusing and messaging for early years crafting and early years design and early years sewing. Mm -hmm. I struggled with it a lot because even though I loved that part of myself, I was really concerned about losing out on a customer base I had already slowly started building. And also that I just was worried about getting bored in this niche and mm -hmm. wanting to pivot or anything else like that. Um, but what I'm finding about niching is that it's actually so freeing and fun. <laughs> it's so, <laughs> it's so freeing to be able to know that this part of me is my business part. It doesn't mean that there's not still parts of me that are home decor and I can't still sew quilts that it's just not what I post on my feed and it's not what I put on my website, but it's still who I am. It's just not what my business is focused on. And I think when I discovered that difference it was very freeing and um, obviously really helped me with the success. That is a great way to think about it. It is. And so you were able to niche down, like you said, early years, which was on the dolls, right? Absolutely. It was on um, the fabric design kind of focused on that sort of audience. So tell us a little bit more about how after you niche down, how that helped you reach your goal. What happened next? I think it just really helped me um, have a clear focus. <laughs> well, we keep coming back to focus, Nikki. <laughs> I know, um, I know. <laughs> just having a clear understanding of my purpose. I mean, it's when you're an entrepreneur, you can do all the things. There's no one telling you, you this is you need to do this, this, this and this. And the exciting part is that no one is telling you, you need to do this, this, <laughs> this, and this. But And um, the terrible part and is terrible nobody part. is telling you. <laughs> and that's where Nikki Bootcamp comes in. And, and I say, Jen, which I have to tell myself this all the time, which is why I can say it to you. You can do anything, but you can't do everything. You can't do everything. <laughs> at least not all at once. Yes, 100%, Nikki, 100%. Right. And when you give yourself permission to say, I love everything, but I just want to do this thing and be known for this and do it better than, mm -hmm. than what's out there in the industry. And yes, just be like excellent at this thing and be known for this thing. Mm -hmm. And that's when I think you really can see like great success happen. So you niche down even further and your collections got better and tighter. So you approached Riley Blake again? I did. I, um, so once I felt like over ready because as artists, you know, <laughs> you know, you can always do more, right? Always, always, always. And yes. at some point you just have to say, I know I've put everything in here. I can't continue to sit here any longer. I have to, I have mm -hmm. to go next. And it was very scary. Like there's a lot of mm -hmm. um, that five seconds of courage that we've talked about before. There's a lot of that that has to happen mm -hmm. always because, um, you know, you've already been rejected or multiple times been rejected. You know, you have your own voices in your own head happening and there's always reasons um, to mm -hmm. and, and not to. And, um, you just have to like swallow and not look back and step forward and, <laughs> and just do it. And I, I think one thing that I, I, it's really important to me, this whole process through is I'm, I always try to be kind. <laughs> I always try to be, um, honest. I always try to give lo lots of grace to other people. Um, cause I often need grace myself, but mm -hmm. I think just be really honest. And the second time I submitted, I, it was honestly me. It was just a hundred percent. I mean, my cover letter, it was just 
everything that I had been working for. And it was just me being a hundred percent honest. And this is what my goal was. And, um, I think all of that combined really just people can see that. So I think it, it all worked together. I think it's amazing. And I remember that first time you told us, I want to be a Riley Blake's designs, fabric designer. Like you were, you were just so excited about that. And to see that come to fruition and not be, you know, a lot of people, the first time they get rejected, they're kind of like, okay, well, that company, you know, I'm going to give up on that. I'm going to go do something else. Or some people would just give up on being a designer, a fabric designer altogether. You stuck with it for sure. So let's talk about what happened next, though. So um, once you submitted to them um, and then you were able to to have your first collection, what was your first collection like? So my first collection was um, Be a Superhero, and it was a mini collection that they actually put through um, a little bit early, I think. So it was a mini collection of just dolls because then two months later, um, a full four skew um, collection called Forest Friends came like right on the tails of that. And it was just very, very exciting to have two collections so close together um, at mm-hmm. the very beginning. And um, I was able to make some great connections with stores and just different people in the industry that have the opportunity to sell your fabric for you, I guess. Well, let's talk a little bit about the fabric, because I think you didn't just have straight like fabric prints that people could create um, quilts out of. Wasn't your doll, your love of dolls also included in this? It is. So I am, I guess, known for, (laughs) see, niche, niche. Um, Mm -hmm. I am getting known for my panels. And so a panel is like a cut and sew panel. So really leaning into not just sewing for early years, but encouraging sewing in early years so that children can sew too. And one way that they can do that is to create these professional dolls, because I am a professional doll maker, onto printed onto a panel that they can just cut the front, cut the back out, and with basic sewing skills on a basic sewing machine, um, pretty much almost anyone can can do and make and make this gorgeous doll, and mm-hmm. um, and just with all of my uh, experience and my membership clubs and all of the different things that we have um, grown into through the process of trying to get here. I have a lot of experience with like doll clothing and then my costume years and stuff too, that I think I've brought a lot to the table there as far as panels go. And um, then they obviously need repeat patterns because the dolls clothes need repeat patterns and it just kind of really built, built from there. And I think what's really unique about your collections, they're not just repeat patterns. I mean, mostly when you think of a pattern collection, or fabric collection, you just think the hero pattern and, you know, some blenders and whatever. Yours has, well, the first one, the Be a Superhero, is mostly the cut and sew dolls. But the, the future ones that you've done include a combination. So you have repeat patterns and you have, um, cut and sew dolls, or I'm looking at some other ones. I'm seeing a, um, a Fox sleeping bag panel. And, and so each of yours has a combination of the repeat patterns and something very specific, a specific project for people to make. That's right. And that is, I haven't looked at a gazillion patterns, but that seems very unique to me. I don't see a lot of that. Oh, thank you so much. And I think it's just really finding um, like what your your heart is telling you and what your gifts are and then just not being scared to to stay focused on them. And and really, because everybody has something to offer and we just need to really like believe in ourselves and really have Mm -hmm. people around us that lift us up to that we can believe in ourselves. And and I want to talk a little bit about your your be a hero, um, be a superhero collection. You also created the most darling quilt pattern 
that basically is a body like with a little cape on it. And then the head would be where the, the actual human being's head would be. Right. Because they pull up the quilts and and then the head is there. Yes. Um, and you did like a mermaid one as well. But the superhero one was fantastic. And didn't you do some charity project around that? That's right. So remember I said I went and did my early childhood education degree and I never used it? Yes, of course. Um, so I guess I can't say that I never used it because um, turning a quilt into a toy is definitely something that, um, you know, is is in us when we're like learning to be like a child or learning how to work with children, right? And so that's where the idea came to me for you know, put, tucking a child in at bed at night and um, when they lay under the covers, then they actually become this um, design that we've created on front of them. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, I started with a Be a Mermaid. I have a Be a Ballerina. There's a Be a Firefighter coming out soon. Um, I think there's a bunch. Be a Superhero um, was actually a pattern I was already working on. And then I, I had a collab a uh, reach out from another, uh, a long arm quilter actually that had a very close personal story to her that just touched me. Um, well, her friend's son, very, very young, um, had cancer and he was five years old battling with cancer and ended up, um, you know, passing away. But there was through that experience, there were so many children on the children's ward on the oncology children's ward that we're fighting and they were all superheroes. So the superhero quilts became launched. I decided to launch those ones with this charity in mind. And we donated um, a portion of all of the sales directly to them for years, for two years, I believe. And um, yeah, it was just a, a great movement and it actually took on a life of its own. It we, we have a hashtag called superhero movement now because there was a just another um, lady in a small town, just a small town. I think they made 50 be a superhero quilts at their quilt guild to donate to a children's hospital. So it's just been. That's fantastic. um, Very empowering. Very empowering. Well, it's just another example, Jennifer, how you leaned into that niche and it was so a part of who you are. I mean, you had that education in your background. You love children and you kind of leaned into that and it has now developed in all these different ways. So you've got the fabric designs with Riley Blake. You have these incredible quilt designs that have launched this movement. Um, and all of that came from you stepping out of your safety zone and really um, diving into this area that was close to your heart. Yay, I know. So, so fun. I mean, looking back, it's so easy. It seems so easy. Right. But it's not. Um looking forward, like, you know, it, and I think your listeners that are starting out, um, need to feel that because it isn't easy knowing the path that you should take. Of course, when you look back on a path that, that has success at the end of it, it's easy to see that it was the right path, but it's not easy to know that that's the right path when you're at the beginning of it and knowing which way to go. And, um, I I think, yeah, having, Having people around you that believe in you and saying what, speaking the dream that you have, even though it seems so, I don't know, unrealistic, maybe even, there's power behind that for sure. Yeah. And along with that, I mean, looking back, yes, you can see where you are now is a beautiful combination of all of the things you are interested in and it all came together. But It came together on a very, very winding path. Very crooked. And yeah, (laughs) with probably some, some wrong turns and having to turn around and. And a few mm -hmm. tears. Yes. 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 But, um, but ultimately it's, it's the right direction for you. Yeah. It's really exciting. But I also want to bring in something else that you have going on that is maybe a little side path. Or you tell us, you also have a membership. I do. Tell us about that and how it fits into your overall plans. You know, um, at the same time that I was aspiring to be a fabric designer, as many of your stardists will know, 
when you are drawing art and not getting revenue, um, <laughs> it's difficult, right? And so, I mean, I, I had to be smart too and think, how am I going to be able to, I mean, I have this goal and this dream and I, I pray that I will realize it to be a fabric designer, but, you know, I also have to have other plans in my business, you know, that are all going to work towards it. And I love teaching. I taught dance for many years and I, like I told you, I have an early childhood education degree. So I really mm -hmm. love teaching. It seemed like a really nice fit that I could share some of my skills yeah, with people that the people that might be interested in them. And I have a wonderful membership that has morphed and changed over the years. Um, honestly, it has changed um, due to like me niching, but it has also changed due to like life, my life changing and um, customers changing and just different needs also. But it's like this li living, breathing, I don't know, arm, I guess, of the business that it's really important to me and um, it really helps me focus. <laughs> yeah, It really helps me focus because if you're accountable, like just like an accountability group does, if you're accountable to a group of people to provide them something every month, then you need to be accountable to that. And it, so it really helps me with my content and mm -hmm. it really helps me um, with my year planning, because I plan a whole year in advance, what's going to happen. And I try to plan them around my fabric collections and it kind of all works together now. Nice. Wow. But, um, yeah, it just really helps me with, with that focus, I think. So what happens as part of that membership? What, um, if somebody joins your membership, what do they learn in a given month? And who is it for? So it's for people that, um, want to sew. So it's a, it's a sewing membership, but it can be quilting or doll making or crafting. And, um, they, so they get each of those genres every month, usually on a theme. So they'll get a quilt pattern and a doll pattern, um, and a craft tutorial, um, every month. And they also get this community and they get education that comes along with it. So through my years of like working with professional doll making and working as ghost pattern writer for, you know, I have a lot of, I think, um, tips and tricks to share. And, um, we do that inside the membership. So they get all the content at the beginning of the month and they can kind of go through it at, as they want. There is a little group that they can chat with each other and share their projects with inside it. It's, it's really not a huge commitment financially for anyone. It's actually less than the cost of one pattern a month. So it's wow. not, not a huge financial commitment for people, which is important to me because I mm -hmm. want people to sew, but it's also not pressured. They don't have to make everything. And what is so exciting, I can tell you, is that um, people that join because they love quilting, they come and tell me, I just made my first doll for my grandchild and they've never made a doll before. Or, or people that just like crafting all of a sudden jo started making a quilt pattern because it's part of the membership and they really enjoy quilting. And so I feel, I don't know, like it's just really, really makes me happy. Well, you're <laughs> yeah. expanding their experiences, their horizons, their skills. Yeah. And what I love about it is you talked about niching down. So you're niching down sort of with the the topic of things that you do, but you still have that breadth of you've got the quilting, you have the doll making, you have the crafting. So you're able to kind of satisfy those urges that you might have to like create those things um, by combining them all in this membership, which I think is really cool. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I absolutely agree, Laura. I think you guys probably even helped me with that, too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I have a very important question for you. Go for it. How the hell do you do it all? So you have this business that contains the membership. You have, you know, you're designing new fabric collections all the time. You're raising four kids. You have a farm where you're growing a lot of your own food. And you, uh, what else? You're designing quilt patterns. You have the membership. I already said that. <laughs> so many things youtube videos for oh so my gosh long. and yes i know how, how do you manage how do you juggle it all this is the question i'm always asking because i'm a terrible juggler but how do you juggle it all how do you manage your time and do you ever sleep <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I mean, it helps that I am pretty hyper. I mean, we'll just be honest. I am a pretty hyper person, but um, I also think that it's also really important to know that we all have the same amount of hours in the day. Nobody has more or less hours and it looks like somebody's doing a lot of things, but they might have help. And so I do have help. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't, I can't, I mean, I didn't at the beginning, but I do now. I cannot possibly sew every single quilt. I do long arm every quilt that I do, but I can't possibly sew everyone. So, um, you know, I get some help um, with web with my website or with my social media. Um, like there is ways that you can, I think Tom Ross actually um, is a really big, I don't know, encourager of this. So I was part of mm-hmm. a membership or I am part of a membership that he has. It's actually a membership for memberships. <laughs> and um, <laughs> he is the founder of Design Cuts for those that that may not know his name. Right. Yeah. It's been very inspiring that way, too, because, um, you know, I started on the, on his membership at the ground floor. So got to speak a lot with him. And he said, which was actually hard to hear at the beginning, but if there's something that you are doing that you could pay somebody else to do which would then free up time for you to do something that somebody else cannot do. um, That can be a revenue generator that you should do that. And that was kind of foreign to me because I thought I should do it all. Mm -hmm. So that's why I don't go to the grocery store. (laughs) (laughs) Because you can pay somebody else to do that. And this episode is sponsored by Instacart. (laughs) Not really at all, but... (laughs) Oh, Nikki. Yes, I know. That's why you have four children, Nikki, that you can like say, you know, go get groceries for mom. Yes. 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 I don't have four children, <laughs> no. so I have to pay somebody to do that. <laughs> you need to train Rocket how to go to the grocery store for you. Oh, yeah. He would eat everything on the way back. Oh, my goodness. OK, so I have another question. Mm. Um, I know that you live in Manitoba. That's right. And Manitoba is Canadian for fucking cold. <laughs> and and basically your studio, if I recall, is in another building sort of outside of the house. And there are certain months of the year or days of the year that if you are, I don't know, if your skin is exposed for more than like <laughs> 10 seconds, you get frostbite. So, so li- just I'll correct you a little bit. Okay, so, okay. Um, Laura, so actually my studio, the, this is, this is the American, <laughs> this is the American understanding of Canada. Oh yeah. dear. Well, okay. A couple of things I need to correct on. So the studio is actually, um, I didn't start in here and everybody should be aware of that too. It started in just the rec room in the basement, um, and then into a bedroom and then we renovated our garage into, so this garage is actually attached to the house. So I'm actually okay. don't have to leave, That's uh, good. but it is, it can be cold. We're slightly less impressed with you now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sorry. I know. <laughs> Not as hearty as you thought. I know. <laughs> But it does uh, like like if you go outside for a certain amount of time, it's like a frostbite situation, is it not? One hundred percent, yes. Especially in January <laughs> and February, no no exposed skin for frostbite warning. They usually give you a time limit, um, like ninety seconds. <laughs> why do you live there? <laughs> and and is this why the kids go to the groceries? <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen our prairie skies? We just actually had the most beautiful dancing northern lights last night they're posted Aww. all over everywhere so open prairie sky um we get ex- super extremes here we have so much so in the winter it's a lot darker for sure but in the summer it is basically like 4 30 in the morning till like 11 30 at night with sun it's um okay well, one of these years i'm gonna drive up there in the bus and yes. visit you in do, the summer do <laughs> <laughs> but I'd be really impressed with you if you came in the winter. I'll just say yes. <laughs> not going to happen. I'm not that interested in you being impressed with me. <laughs> I'm just now leaving Florida after being here for the winter. OK, let's get back on track. <laughs> um, what have we forgotten to ask you? Well, I guess the exciting thing that I, I mean, I don't know if there's anything that you haven't asked me, but I think the thing to know is once 
you are in, like once you get a yes, once you get a yes, I don't want people to think that it's always a yes. So there's still no's like there's <laughs> like it's just mm-hmm. part of the um, what happens. And and you put work because even though you get yes and you get now you're a Riley Blake Designs fabric designer, um, it still means that you have to submit often and there could be lots of no's for lots of different reasons. Maybe they've just done the, a collection that you're submitting for already, or maybe somebody else has submitted one at the same time. You know, maybe it's just not the right colors. Maybe there's lots of other reasons. Let's actually talk about that process just a little bit. So they accepted your first few and you submit something else. So how does that process work? Do you create a collection and then submit it? Or do you come up with a concept, run it past them before you finish it out? Do they give you suggestions? How does that work? So there's no, I guess, one way. There's no hard and fast way. I think it's really dependent on the designer, um, maybe even their niche, um, how many other designers are in that niche and all of the things, like all of the above, really. Right. But in your mm-hmm. experience, all of the above. But for me personally, I think what works best for me, who I am and just how I work is I try to ask. I think I'm getting a lot more confident now. So I should say that I'm working on my seventh collection right oh, now. Wow. So there's four that are out in the world and two that are going to be shown shortly. So I am working on my seventh collection. So I'm starting to feel more like I know what um, customers want and what the company wants. Wait, wait, wait. Let me pause and say, you're working on your seventh. Your first one came out last summer? Well, so like I said, there's a big lag, right? Right. So mm-hmm. that's right. The first one came out last summer, but that's um, a year before that also, right? Okay, still, so, yeah. mm-hmm. let's still be impressed that <laughs> it has not been that long and you're working on your seventh. Yeah, it's super exciting. So, okay, now carry on. Okay. I don't remember <laughs> what I was saying now. Yeah. I, I just had to pause to be impressed by that for a minute. Oh. But um, I was asking you about, about the process of it, like... Do you bring them ideas? Do you bring them a finished collection? So it's easiest for, um, I think, I mean, I'm not the art director, but I I think it's easiest for them to see, like if you give them a concept idea to know what to expect after you have a lot of history with them. So like the, the more history and the more you are, in your um, style and in your niche, then they can know what to expect from you. So then if you say, I like to work on this theme next, you'll have a better possibly idea about direction. Right. Because they know your style and they know how you put a collection together. I think so. Mm -hmm. Yes. But yeah, I think really at the beginning, I mean, all the hard work, (laughs) all the hard work is at the beginning because you have to put in all this work before on collections, like I have so many collections that will never see the light of day because they're just not good enough anymore, but they were my practice collections to get me where I am. And so you put all this hard work in there. And so when you are starting in a company, then you still put all that hard work in there to show everything that you can. I mean, I'm even designing the quilt patterns to go so I can give the whole vision, you know, the whole, Mm -hmm. the whole concept and really, um, they can come along on the journey of that collection with you. Right. Yeah. So I don't think anybody should feel like I've arrived. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I yeah. think it's always work. There's always still going to be rejection. It's going to, it's always going to be that. But I'm learning more and more and more that rejection doesn't scare me anymore. It like fuels me to make it better. And every time, every time I've been rejected and I've put my focus that way, it's been better. And when you work in a company situation with an amazing company like Riley Blake Designs, Mm -hmm. um, you get it's a it's a team like it really is a family and a team. And so they have suggested things to me. Oh, try. Why don't you try this or maybe this color or why don't you turn this over here? And um, sometimes I'm like, oh, yes, I can see that. And sometimes I'm thinking, oh, I don't know. I really like it how it is. But. 
but I, if I try it, sometimes I'm like, oh, I liked it how it was before. And they go, oh, yes. Or sometimes I'm just thinking, wow, yes, it just elevated. Why didn't I think of that? Yes, it elevated yeah. my art. Just that one little thing, you know, it just elevated it. And so mm-hmm. it's really important to not to know you don't have to do it all on your own. And that doesn't have to be a company that can be your people doing that with you. Like right. your, your mm-hmm. accountability group or your people. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So what is one piece of advice that you would give to someone just getting started with fabric design? My advice, if you want a career in fabric, is to be around fabric because fabric art is different than other art um, in the sense that a full collection feels really, really different because there's, I mean, I know that there is this still, like if you're going with wrapping paper or even um, craft papers, being around different fabrics and seeing how they play together and understanding them in a quilt. Because designing for paper versus designing for fabric is different. You need a lot of non-directional um, for fabric because you cut these pieces mm-hmm. and you turn them and you do all sorts of things to them, mm-hmm. um, to make them into something else, especially if you're in the quilt industry. So I think just really getting comfortable with fabric art mm-hmm. and, um, and then trusting you, trusting yourself. So that's, that's really great advice. Well, both of them are really great advice. Absolutely. Trust yourself. But the first part about, if you want to do fabric, get really into, be really in that world makes total sense because I really like doing repeat patterns, but I don't sew. I'm not a quilter. I admire them, but I don't do them. So I don't have that knowledge about how these things are going to be used. I have it in the abstract, but not with any experience. So Mm -hmm. it's much harder for somebody like me to try to design a really functional full pattern fabric collection. Whereas, um, I'm working on things that are more, um, home goods, you know, it's it's not, it'll be a few patterns that work together in different ways. And that's something that, that I can have more experience with because it's not, it's not a world I don't know. So I absolutely agree. Whatever, whatever niche you're, you're wanting to get into or whatever industry, get really, really deeply involved in it. Yeah. And I don't mean that you need to, to sew at all in order to be a fabric designer. There's lots. And actually, you know, I was a ghost pattern writer for so long and don't put the ghost pattern writers out of um, jobs just because, you know, (laughs) so we, we don't, but, but saying that is that just, I mean, understanding, like just right seeing it. And so anything that you, that like lights you up, that you get so excited about is what is your art is going to shine the best in, you know, if fabric is what just makes you um, like you dream in fabric. I always say I dream in fabric. So, (laughs) you know, it just feels really natural for me to be in this industry. It's a perfect fit. It really is. So Jennifer, we have so enjoyed having you here today on the show, giving us um, lots of advice on how to get started in fabric design And we'd love to know where can our listeners connect with you online? So I have a website and it's called Be So Inspired. So it's B-E-E like a bumblebee and then Mm -hmm. so as an S-E-W and then inspired. And that name came from... Um, When my kids were little, actually, I, we do have a, we live on a farm, like Nikki said, and I have a huge garden um, with a lot of fruit and stuff too. So I wanted the bee to represent that part of myself that I love canning and that whole, that whole side of it, obviously sewing. And then just, I'm constantly being inspired. I think I feel even more than I'm inspiring. I just, just like seeing my kids, seeing People seeing like we saw the Northern Lights the other night. I mean, just all of that. I just see it. And I think that needs to be fabric. That needs to be a quilt, you know. And (laughs) so it just seems really. You're definitely in the right business. (laughs) All right. So be so inspired. And um, on your social media, is it the same handle? It is all on all the places on YouTube, on Pinterest, um, Facebook, all the places. Yeah. Perfect. And if people are interested in your Makers Club, they can also find you at BeSoInspired.com. That's correct. Yes. Thank you. Jen, 
Thank you so much for being here. Um, we've been wanting to do this for so long and glad we finally made it happen. And you have said so many inspirational things while you were talking. I was like, ooh, that's a quote I can pull out. That's a quote. <laughs> oh, yay. You were just fantastic. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much. To learn more about Jennifer and read today's Stardust Society show notes, go to StardustSociety.com slash Jennifer Long. If you've enjoyed today's episode, we'd love for you to share it with a friend. Sharing helps us reach more Stardusts like you and keeps us inspired to create new episodes. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. <laughs>